Woke up at six o'clock in the morning, chilling with coffee mugs, me and coffee chugs, talking education all across the nation, pushing boundaries, thinking innovation. Chaos. Hello, everybody. How you doing? Welcome to another episode on Living on the Edge of Chaos podcast. I know I'm a broken record after so many episodes, but I am like super, super the, at the time of this recording, it's a Monday morning and I cannot think of a better way to start my week than to have a conversation with the guests we're going to have today. And what I am so excited about is one is I've been following and learning all the stuff she's been sharing a recent kind of uh lurker follower on her work here just in the last month or two. But as the more I, I dive into her work, the more I see connections and we'll get into some of this stuff in terms of creativity and art and expression and, and, and bringing out voices and storytelling, which is really the, the focus of where I want to bring a lot of this, this attention to the podcast this season is how do we weave and narrate story into the work that we're doing, whatever that, that work might be. And so I'm, I'm really excited to, to dive into this, this show today. And today the guest is none other than, than Heather Cooper. And for many of you who listen that are in the K-12 space, I'm going to go on a limb and be like, it's probably not a name that is popping up in all the education newsletters and circles, but I think this is definitely someone you're going to want to add to your network. And no doubt at the end of this show, I know many of you are going to be following uh, her work because the education she's helped me with, I think, is, is, is going to be transformative in thinking about our approaches to expression, storytelling, how we teach, how we learn, and just maybe ways that isn't always, I would say, like the standard K-12 approach. Um, so without further ado, Heather, one, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Let's just start off and let people know, who are you, what do you do, and what in the world do you got going on? And I know that right there, looking at all your channels and stuff, that could be the show right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm just so flattered and um, honored to be here. And as you're speaking about K through 12 approaches, my um, perspective is pretty interesting because my parents were educators and mm -hmm. my both my parents met in college while they were, you know, studying and they became teachers. They got married right as they graduated and um, they ended up teaching for their entire careers. And my well, teaching and then my father became a principal and my mm -hmm. mother was a guidance counselor. So they all um, they them those my parents and then several family members are teachers public school teachers okay and um my mother was an avid um she has been involved with the state and um national like NA, nea and psea in pennsylvania she was a delegate um oftentimes she would go to the national conventions as a delegate for pennsylvania and so i just have that's part of my dna mm. um, the small town that i'm from outside of pittsburgh it's it's a place where a lot of teachers in my school, there were a lot of the teachers, my classmates were their children. And we just grew up with the same group of people throughout life. So my perspective on that, I have four kids now and mm. I kind of taken like the things since my mother was a guidance counselor. She was always our summer work would be reading comprehension workbooks and math. And we do a page of, you know, the chapter of reading comprehension and we do some math before we could do anything else for the day. R book reports, um, dictionary work, all these things that prepared us. So as soon as we, my sister and I could read, that's what we were doing. And with my kids, I, like the love of reading, you know, ended up with the storytelling and creativity um, from a very young age. My mother just pushed books, any kind of classics, whatever, until you find your genre. And I have multiple. So I've always kind of carried that with me, but I'm a healthcare professional. I went into, I'm a pharmacist. Uh, I've been a pharmacist for over 20 years. And when you're, you know, I wasn't able to do much with creative writing, art or anything like that while I was doing that in, um, you know, in college, getting my degree. I did get an opportunity to have a couple of creative writing courses and always wanted to write a book um, and tell stories. But as a pharmacist, it's kind of like I ended up accumulating thousands of stories over three states, um, working in different community pharmacies, hospitals, and just talking to people, meeting characters, and living out in scenarios and settings. So 
I have like my sister used to tell me, you should write a book about all these interactions that you have. And I'm like, yeah, I don't have time to do that. But <laughs> that's where I came at. Like I've always had that creativity, but just didn't have an opportunity to do much writing. I've read a lot still throughout my life. Um, but when the pandemic happened, I did, I was laid off about five years before the pandemic happened and we moved, okay. relocated, and I ended up staying home for a little while to make sure that I could be there for my kids because uh, the youngest two were, I have twins that are the youngest and they were in mm. second grade. Up Not the to, full-time job. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, four kids, two, two were in second grade, one's fifth grade, the other one was in ninth grade and we moved here. So I stayed home for a while. Then I couldn't find a job, which is weird. This pharmacy, you would think that we never <laughs> right. had a short yet. But um, when the pandemic hit, it kind of gave me an opportunity to go out and back- vaccinate. So they needed pharmacists to go out and vaccinate in the, in the nursing homes. Started doing that. And I went out and as I was doing that, I was able to, you know, start doing a little bit more, making a little bit of money. Um, I worked several jobs like mass. I was at mass vaccination sites, um, you know, Mercedes Benz Stadium in Atlanta, running that kind of thing, working with Emory University, going into the nursing homes with the seniors. Um, That was like and that was in December 2020 in the height of before I was vaccinated even. So that was a heck of an experience. But at the same time, my dad was in. I had to have him institutionalized for um, dementia. He had to go to a facility all the way in Pennsylvania, and I couldn't see him from um, all the way down here. So it was kind of like just using all this uh, energy and wanting to give back to help out some kind of way. But after that, I learned, I decided I'm going to get some skills so that when this is over, I'll have some kind of job opportunities because I don't want to get stuck again just trying to get a pharmacist job somewhere. And so I learned how to code. I enrolled in a six-month boot camp. Uh, Georgia Tech, and I learned how to full stack web development. And I decided, you know what, I think I want to write. I want to be a tech writer. The documentation is terrible. You can't understand it. And maybe I can write in a way that people can understand. I like to break down complex information. That's how I do. So as I was learning how to write, uh, learning how to code, I finished that, decided I'm going to go ahead and start writing, freelance writing, ended up on a writing in on Medium at first, you know, um, my blog there. And then I uh, came on to X Twitter at the time for a 30 day writing challenge and I never left. So that's kind of where I started. It's a long meandering story, but, you know, I'm still working. I've, I was lucky enough to get a job where I'm working from home as a medical abstractor, as a contractor. And I'm sitting here with all my computers for work and for this. So it's kind of nice because I'm able to continue doing that. But then I, I didn't think, first of all, that I would like coding. I love it, but I haven't been coding. Now I love uh, creating content. Didn't know what that meant, yeah, right. but now I understand. When I first came here on Twitter and when I was started writing, I wanted to, it was about um, inclusive, creating inclusive content, mm-hmm. um, structuring content for neurodiverse uh, individuals and because there's a lot in the tech community or that are online, autism, um, autistics, dyslexics, ADHD, and trying to make sure like the font and how you structure you leaving white space and the type of words you're using, um, the visual information. I'm drawn to visual content because it, it crosses all the barriers of education, language, culture, and you can tell a story better yeah. and people are going to understand it faster. And uh, it just makes more sense with visual content. So I was already pushing like infographics and things like that to help explain to t- people. You show them, tell them and then have them repeat it back to you or show you how they're going to do it. So that it will for whatever story that you're trying to tell or whatever information you're trying to convey. So a, I, Really, that's kind of how I got into visual content. I'm not an artist, not a designer. Um, I just had some art a couple of years in high school, and I loved it, but that's not my thing. Um, And I don't pretend to make it that. So I try to teach people how to do that. And then as AI, I was starting to play around with different AI art 
generators and things like that. Then when ChatGPT was introduced, I started messing around with it and I realized this is amazing. I can't believe the amount of information (laughs) that we have. I was afraid at first because I thought there's no way we're going to be allowed to have this much information. You know, the the powers of be are going to probably limit this from us. So I decided to start telling people, here's all the things you can do with it. You know, and that was like my first viral thread. 11 things you can do with ChatGPT to save you time. And just trying to hit anything I could think of for everybody that was writing online, um, even translating language, everything. So all those two things kind of combine in learning how to like speak to AI in a way for prompting for ChatGPT and other LLMs and image generators. Man, I, that is just incredible. There's so many, my brain's just firing at all cylinders because it's, it's so <laughs> fascinating, right? So I appreciate you sharing it because, you know, like from my angle of how I connected to, to your work or came across your work was through Twitter. Um, and to be honest, you know, if, without you sharing all that, would have no idea. and would have no no concept of uh, your journey. And not that that needs to be on Twitter. I'm just saying like I came at it and – I started nerding out and I still nerd out on the idea of creating images and now video and different types of things within AI. And I know there's, there, there's lots of pros and cons to that. And there's lots of court cases, but I find it vastly fascinating. And oh, I yeah. would consider you very much an artist and creator and designer <laughs> um, as I, as I, follow your journey on on twitter and now you've got other channels and youtube and things we'll talk about um and so that that whole process of of how you got there is incredibly fascinating and it also hits on some personal level i mean at the the time of this recording i'm sitting i've been in education now over 20 years and my current role um our governor is looking to, to to cut it completely across the state so as i'm hearing your journey of pivots and shifting and adjusting and I'm kind of sitting in this like murky on, on, on a personal phase going, hey, there, you know, there maybe there are opportunities because it's mm-hmm. it, it's incredible what you're doing. And you did. Incredible, you. You're still doing incredible work in the pharmacy work and helping during COVID, you know. But then I sit there and I, and where I know you is, oh, my gosh, she is creating some incredible AI. Artwork, <laughs> uh, and I want to know more. Uh, so so that's so fascinating. And so. You know, as as we as you shared that, and now you're 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 in this space, and I'm, I know you're doing lots of other things. You've got quite the following. Your 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 platforms are um, incredibly designed. You know, this is probably a a pretty obvious answer to what you just shared. But I always do like to ask people because I am like a comic bird. Comic, comic bird. No, I'm not comic bird. A comic book junkie. There we go. I can get the words out. You know. Um, <laughs> You've already kind of shared your origin story, but what would you consider your your your, your superpower? And so, as as you're thinking through this, I mean, I could think of you have quite a few in your arsenal. Um, but you know, <laughs> what would you consider that to be? And, th- and the reason I think this is important, especially for the lot of the audience that listens to this, is an education. This is what I'm so excited about. Is this is you know. Um, you're coming at it from such a different perspective, but it's so real. Uh, the, the adjustments, the pivots, the very things we're trying to help kids develop skills with. You got to be ready for whatever life throws at you. You know, you got to be ready for whatever the tech is going to shift and change, and jobs are going to shift and change, and society is going to shift and change. Um, oh you are a living, breathing example of that very thing. So, I'm getting a little long-winded yeah. here, but you know, no, what no. would you consider to be your uh, superhero superpower? Uh, as you're, you're, you're navigating all the things. You know, it's funny because I don't, it's hard to like self-awareness, you know, like I have no idea why people, <laughs> you know, listen, it, it, why I have followers like I do because I think I'm kind of boring, but, um, or I, you know, I, I'm nerding out on all kinds of stuff all the time. But, um, you know, I think that part of it is the ability to like, as a pharmacist over years and just period, I'm empathetic. And I have um, a lot of, I've been around a lot of different people, situations my entire life. And I know that everybody has a story. So, and also that people can't necessarily explain things as well as they would like to. So I'm always listening to, say somebody comes into a pharmacy and they're asking, um, you know, for something for their stomach. I'm listening for cues and things that are in there that they're telling me that they may not know how to explain it. 
So I think about what do they need to know? What could I give them? What, how could I explain it to this particular person from their point of view, their perspective? How could they, how can I give them something that makes sense? And so I have the ability, I guess, being uh, like uh, uh, adaptable in res- resilient, obviously. Yeah. I'm sure. always hustling, hustling, grinding. It, it almost killed me not working for a few years. I just sat here like, oh my goodness, I just am not made for this. I've been working in um, since I was 16. As soon as I could get a work permit, I was out dunking donuts, whatever, and yeah. just staying busy um, doing that type of thing in you know, earning a living. So it's like, I just feel that I think that the superpower is kind of like, I'm not afraid to try things. I love experimenting with new technology and just different things, new ideas. Um, There's nothing, it's just, it's not like, oh, I can't do that because I don't know how, I just don't know how to do it yet. And I'll learn how to do it. And I can take in a lot of complex information, a ton of it, and then, um, understand it and execute on that. And that's how I was able to go from job to job with completely different things. Like what I do now is not touching pills at all. It's mostly data analysis and working with, I'm the only pharmacist working with all these physician assistants and nurse practitioners going through and it's public health still related to COVID. And it's Mm. like, it's a little tiring, but I know if I got to learn it, I'll learn it. And so, and then be able to explain it to people to help them, you know, so my superpowers is kind of adapting resilience and being trying to ex- think of how can I make somebody else understand this concept or this information. Yeah, I love how you frame that. And it, it automatically makes me think about the educators that I work with and support. And so in my role, there's in my region, there's 21 school districts in which I do a variety of support in STEM and computer science, social studies, uh, technology. So uh, AI has been uh, something that a lot of districts are just trying to wrap their head around of what does this mean? What does it not mean? What do we need to think about, not think about, you know? And so as you're, you're sharing that, I can't help but think those same kind of skills and mindset that you just shared is what, is what educators do also all day, every day, as they're taking in all this complex information and figure out how can I help students learn themselves, content skills, you know, insert the 10,000 things that go into um, the development of any child, whether that's in the classroom, outside the classroom with community yeah. and parents or whatever it might be. So my question to you is kind of a, a segue, because you're, you're, you're doing this incredible work with the pharmacy and learning that and, and, and upskilling. You've also got this other kind of social media space in which you're, you're sharing your, your AI work, your creation, you're having these incredible conversations. I want to get to your YouTube channel and your newsletter and some of that here in just a second. How did it talk to me a little bit more about, and here's how I'm going to phrase it. Like, so as I go in and I'm helping schools and educators and PD and stuff, talk about AI, so many freeze up. And they don't think they can. They don't know how to get started. And it's not that they're not capable. That is completely not the case. But what they do naturally all day, every day, they're not seeing that same shift to the learning. And some of that maybe it's just burnout and they don't have enough energy and capacity. But there's there's a riff that I see missing where it's like, hey, let's get into this. Oh, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Talk to me a little bit about how you took your skill set mindset, all the skills you developed and upskilled in the pharmacy world and still do and applied that to this other space that was, that was also new to everybody. Like how did you overcome that hurdle? Or maybe it just, you just, you just did and that's just who you are. But I think it's an interesting riff that I see in a lot of mindset with people. Well, um, I will, before I forget is that um, for, as far as for the education space and how to people, how educators can approach it since I have the four kids I have a pretty good um, opportunity <laughs> to, because they were all, none of them are into this at all, at all. Right. My daughter is an artist and um, she's heavy in audio visual, like movie. she wants to be a filmmaker and, you know, this, it, but she's also, you know, traditional art too. Yeah. And they're all of my children are excellent writers and um, they're just like communication, all of these different things that they could do. 
but they are all kind of like, no, I'm not allowed to use chat GPT because we're, you know, because it, you know, it'll be cheating. And what, so what I do is sometimes what I've been trying to teach them is how you can use it to help supplement it. Because the way I see it, and I hope that eventually it becomes like this in the um, educator space, is that it's something like we you, teachers don't have enough time to devote to each student. And it's, you know, so much work that they're doing at school and bringing home. So it's basically a way for them to have their own tutor. You're able to, the amount of information that I can process now that I have access to all these things, there, anything I want to know about anything, I can summarize it. I can get in, you know, links to citations to find out more information. I can have it explain it to me in a different tone. I can have it in a third grade, the voice of that, I can ask it additional questions for my daughter. I was, we were asking it for help for, um, you know, chemistry equations, but not just, oh, can you show us what's the answer? Why is this the answer? Yeah. And what, can you give me another example? How can I study for this? Can you give me a mnemonic? Um, can you make it into a song? You know, something like that. If they can make flashcards, you can draw, you can, you know, visualize an image that shows that, you know, just tell it in Dolly. There's so many little things that language, you know, how can, what's, can you translate it in the way it's spoken in this language, not just translate it as it's written. There's like, whatever you want to ask, you can find ways to supplement what you're doing. Can you help me outline this in a different way, a mind map, you know, just all kinds of things like that. Why does this image look like this? What are the what are the main characteristics of this image, this painting? What style is that? What are other examples of that particular art style or that particular, even debating rhetoric? It's really mm -hmm. good at rhetoric. What are the arguments against this particular topic? What would people say? Um, how could I, you know, what, what do people on the opposite side of this believe and why? And give examples and give me links to go look that up. So that's how I see that. And I keep trying. My oldest one, he's been using it more and more to help him summarize and outline things. You know, um, what's a better way I could write this? You're not going to copy and paste it, but it's kind of like, oh, I didn't think about that. I can yeah. I, I, give me a list of FAQs that I could think about and I can address that in the writing. So those are the types of ways that educators I can imagine for teachers to be able to lesson plans, you would be able to go so much farther if to have that. And I know that's a huge chunk of time, right? So yeah. to be able to simplify that faster and go through that scheduling, oh my goodness, you know, that's always an issue. Right. But it's like, there's so many uses and I really hope that people are able to come, like to get over these, the initial, oh, it's going to be cheating to, we have this inf these tools, this information that can help us do much more for these kids. Yeah. And th whether they're in person, synchronous, asynchronous, whatever. Um, so when I started writing about, when I started doing, using AI art, there was a lot of uh, backlash. And there were people, we would get a lot of um, nasty threats and just horrible, vile language and you know, you just like death threats almost, and you don't deserve to live because you're using AI, you're taking um, artist jobs. And it's kind of like the things that I'm making are not things that I'm taking from anybody. It's just, right. I'm actually able to, it, when you're typing in an idea, you have something in your mind, and then you can visualize that and it, it creates something and you're like, wow, I never even, you know, like I, I can see my imagination taking place here. I can see it visualize in front of me. So, um, trying to like consider that I know everybody, a lot of people had, they were coming at it from different uh, points of view and there's a lot of fear and thinking, well, what if it's taken over the world, like Terminator or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot of crazy stuff out there and I'm sure that sure. it's going to, there's just going to be a lot, like people worried about deep fakes and things. There was already deep fakes, you know, whether or not we had this technology um, I think that there's still more benefit to it out there because it's more of an equalizer. There's so many people that there are barriers and obstacles to learning or to be able to get the skills that they need to, you know, do more for their own personal um, journey, for their for their income, for whatever. So I think that it's not worth kind of holding halting progress just because some people are going to do bad stuff with it. They're going to do that anyway. So I, yeah. but I also know, 
I have to be careful the way I say that and consider <laughs> yeah, right. that. And um, I'm trying, you know, so I try to be one of the most interesting things is that throughout this following, it's so wild and I am still trying to wrap my brain around it. I have a huge a range of people that follow me, people from opposite political spectrums and everything. It just, it's just wild um, how I cannot believe, you know, I was pretty politically active or, or enough. So at least I felt like I was, you know, yeah. I don't even look at the news and stuff anymore. <laughs> it's just it's like, not good for your health. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this replaced it because it's something that gave me so much more to do. Mm. And it's, it stimulates my mind so much more just kind of watching the news to see what how so-and-so said in Congress or what the president or this country what they're doing if you can't do anything about it um, I'm not saying like ignore it but it wasn't really helping me at all and yeah. um, it, I could do I do what I have to do to vote and things like that but beyond that there's you get you know there's limits so in the right. meantime I figure I'm going to use this time to go ahead and see what I could do it maybe helps other people you know but it also kind of brings people together and that's what I think about a lot of this generative AI is that there's all these different groups of people that come together in my spaces on Friday, every Friday I have a, you know, the weekly catch up space. Yeah. And there's just a huge amount of people. And it's not just, um, you know, artists or writers, it's founders and builders, developers, um, journalists, um, you know, educators, there's all kinds of people that are there. So um, I try to make sure I'm speaking to all of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that. It's such a, such a great perspective and you know as you talk a little bit there about the idea of bringing people together which i think is something i see ai as a wonderful opportunity to look back at what we have and have not done as a society or as humanity whether that's through the layers of education or just community at large and the things we've kind of like overlooked glossed over ignored ai has kind of brought all that stuff back into the fold and so i see it as a, a really truly a, a great opportunity for us to address maybe things that um we have it in, in whatever capacity or role we want we want to take that angle yeah. you know and you talked about your your spaces where you bring people together to talk on friday um i i know that you have just a phenomenal newsletter that i feel like is just kind of like its own course where i sit there and, and learn so much <laughs> on whatever your your learning yeah, i follow you on on twitter to see all the things that you've got going on there so this is going to be kind of like a two-part question the first part is this i'm i'm always fascinated by processes and and how people do what they do and so the first part is I want to get in this. I'll give you the second part is I want to learn more about your process of how you create and kind of your thinking with that. But before we get into that, I want to get into how you, like you talked about at the beginning of the show with your skills that you can take lots of information, complex information, and you can break that down to help other people understand it. And you're talking about doing that in the pharmacy world. And I feel very feel that you do that such a tremendous job now with your newsletter and the YouTube and the Twitter and like, it just feels um, attainable for people that are learning. So my question for you on this first part is, can you kind of guide us through or think through or talk through how you curate, how you process, how you make sense of that? Because I think one of the, of the issues, whether education or not, is there is so much going on. There's so many updates. There's so many AI tools. There's so many companies. There's, if you follow the news, AI is in the, like, there's, it, and you feel like you're drinking from a fire hose. And so I think some yeah. people are like, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> and so I'm curious you're in that you have this following because obviously you're doing that's a sign that you're doing great work how what's your process to kind of figure things out to even get to the point of i'm going to share this out um because i think that's a such a key thing that i think could be really helpful for a lot of people uh because it's <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's information overload well one thing that i do is um i subscribe to a lot of newsletters you know and a lot of my peers and um, because it, it got to the point where um, pretty early on last year, we realized we can't keep up with everything. We just can't. So yeah. uh, it's kind of like certain things. I just leave it alone because I'm not going to even a lot of developing information, developer information. It, that's a whole nother 
I know when I get into that, I'll end up in a rabbit hole that I'm not going to be able to do other things. So it is hard to um, like decide what to focus on. So what I kind of been doing is a lot of it, of course, it's visually AI. So I, I'm still visual and I but I also the people probably don't realize how much I care about writing and how you know, how that how you're writing online and Twitter was great to learn how to condense ideas and to write because it used to be the 280 characters and even yeah. still I want to write where it's shown above the fold and not where it's going to go extra and what's going to grab people's attention and how will they know how that idea is conveyed well, how can I c convince them that they need to read this or is something even like with the title and the first you know sentence or the hook um, what is it, how is it going to reach people and trigger them to think, oh, let me see what this is about and what, and the image helps too. And that's why I like to have a fantastic image that grabs people too. Um, but it, it, I, it's kind of like my curation process. I like to keep up with the latest things that are happening related to what I'm doing mostly, which is, you know, image generation, now video generation, along with that would be voice, um, you know, the how do you use that type of thing to narrate, how do you, uh, summary tools, um, I'm a big fan, I'm going to write some more about YouTube summary tools, because, mm. you know, people, it's a, it's a university, it's whatever, there's a lot of information, though, available on YouTube, and if you can summarize that without having to watch it, and get it, you know, and learn, get it in a certain format that you can go through it and point by point, like, what do I need to know if I need to go back to that? So the way I, um, I look, try to, what I've been doing is people, they, a lot of people struggle with processes and how to, what do you do with all this information? So I just try to show them how to use these tools to help them and how I'm using them because I don't use them traditional, like a traditional graphic artist or designer uh, or copywriter. I yeah. use it in a way that a regular person who doesn't have that experience would use it. And then I want to show people how to do that too. So when I kind of come at it as where it may not be as polished as other people, the way they're presenting it, but I just want to make people feel, I don't want people to feel like it's unattainable. I want them to feel like they could do it too. And um, I go over a lot of tools that I think would be helpful to people in different areas that are related to what I'm doing. And then if others kind of find some use out of that, then that's helpful. You know, I'm glad that I'm able to help serve that. But my process is kind of just start with, I scan these newsletters to see what's, what are they talking about and the things that interest me. Um, tools are the biggest thing. We all kind of focus on tools and things like that. But um, which ones would I use, which I test them out to see, is this worth it? Is it too hard? Do you have to pay for it? What do you got to sign up? How many steps you have to go through? And yeah. if it's worthwhile, then I'll share it and let people know that yeah, just, you know, you can do what you want to do, but I would go with these ones here and then you can, you know, go check out Matt Wolf or, um, Ben's bites and see what's going on there. Um, Bilavel, he's doing the 3d um, and I don't feel like learning it at this moment, but <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I mean, so I kind of like, yeah, okay, okay, sure. Yep. But, um, you know, and just trying to figure out, I think it helps to know where to look for stuff too. Mm. And, um, I try to direct people when I find cool things in directories and, um, places that you can find those tools, like there's an AI for that, or oh, what's, there's a one that's called, um, it's something that gives you alternatives too. Like it's, mm. it's, I forget what the name of it is. I put it in one of my newsletters. I got to go back and find it. But yeah, my processes are all over the place and it just depends on what I'm working on. But I am a big spreadsheet person. I have okay. um, tons of spreadsheets where I have thousands of prompts saved. When I see something interesting or a tool, I put it onto my spreadsheet. I have a Google, Google Sheets open all the time on my, um, in my browser so I put the link and the name and maybe a description, or if it's a prompt, I'll put the prompt and then I'll uh, put the link to the post or wherever I found it. Or if it's something that I developed on my own from asking ChatGPT or other tools, then I can, or if I just kind of developed it, I keep a list of that. So I have thousands and thousands of lines worth of all that stuff. 
and then I can go back to it if I need it. But I sh- that's how I share a lot of information. So I have to have it structured in a way where I can like I'll have one spreadsheet has like 50 tabs on it. But I have to label each tab so I'll know like, OK, this is the these are the prompts that I found in January. These are the prompts I found in February. And I go oh. through it like that. And sometimes I'll color code it like, well, this one I really liked and I want to so I can find it faster. So I do that. And then I have different note systems. I use MEM um, because it self organizes. I don't have to put tags and folders and things like that because I hate doing that. I don't use Obsidian and Notion is a little bit bulky, but MEM. too much for me. I can just, and that's, and Mem uses AI to do that. So it's one of my favorites that I've been using. So if I find, I'll just start a new like Mem, memo, note, whatever. And then I can like search back through there and find that if I need to. No, I love I just, that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks yeah, for sharing I, that. Cause I know I mm-hmm. just signed up for Mem. I haven't used it. My, I have a newsletter and I blog and I write, but I feel like my back end is not as productive as it, as it should be. I I use Apple Notes, but my problem is I've got so many of them and I yeah. need to go back and find what I need. I can't find it half the time. And then I, but I try to like capture bits and pieces whether I'm on my phone or if I'm on my computer device, at least notes, it all kind of syncs up. Um, There's another app. My, yeah, but my, I try my. to create my newsletter. It takes forever because I'm like, okay, because not all my notes are AI notes. You know what I mean? They're, yeah. They're, their life notes and grocery lists and to-do lists. So I'm like, I spend more time going through trying to find, okay, which one is the AI? Cause of course I didn't label it. Well. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I signed up yeah. for them, but I haven't used it, but maybe I need to, I need to get back in there. Yeah. Try it and see, because it'll just, it, it will, it puts things together. It links similar things together automatically. So if you, yeah. you know, with that topic, it can find if that, just that word within your, the text that you put in there. So yeah. for me, it's easy, but my mind is another one. That's another one that is easy and it has a browser um, extension too. And that is also, it's a, Matt Wolf explained to me how he used that. And that's one of the ways he curates all this information for his shows, his newsletter and future tools. But my mind, Mm -hmm. you can just click on it and it'll save it. um, It it saves like a visual version of it. Um, Mm -hmm. If you, if you put that URL or whatever in there, um, you just click on that and then it'll just have it like as a little note card somewhere it's separately and you can tag it or else it'll tag it for you. Yeah. Too. I love that. Yeah. So. I use spreadsheets too. Um, I'm not always the best at updating. So what I have, I've got Google spreadsheets. I've got four of them. Um, and then I use chat GPT to help me code because I wasn't quite smart enough to write all the code on my own, but I have on my website then the pages to it. So you can go into on my AI page. I've got one for like my learning journey. And every time I come across a, a YouTube video or maybe it's like an online course or whatever it might be, mm-hmm. I fill it in on the spreadsheet. But then on my website, it's a drop down menu that's sorted by the category. So someone can go in oh. and be, I want, you know, AI image tutorial. And then it would do that if you're looking for like courses and it would, it would link that out. And I do the same thing for like prompts. I have them organized by category. So um, I'm just not always the best at always you're, getting all of it out there. Me. But one of the things that I've loved, it, it just takes time uh, for image creation, which I do. This is where I do want to get into your process for how you create such awesome images. But you've talked about already is then if I create if I have like a prop that I love, like I'll just nerd out. and I'll just make just oodles and oodles of images like, oh, let's try this. Let's try this. Let's try this. Mm-hmm. But if mm-hmm. I have the ones I like, I'll, I'll organize them in a uh, in Google Photos as a as an oh. album. So then with the prompt that if people want to see see the prompt, see the example. Then if I'm up to speed with it, I'll also have a link then to that album where they can see examples of the artwork that I created with that prompt. Um, You're so, very organized. Well, <laughs> I the key is I have way more hidden on the back end. I don't always get it to the spreadsheets for the people to see, but it's, it's, I want to be able to document it so I can go back. Cause there's times I'm like, Ooh, how did I create that image? And I want to know, and I have a lot of liked uh, tweets. That's where a lot of my, my inspiration is. But then I'm I'm scrolling for days too because I don't have it organized. But I like your idea of by month, um, just because yeah. that, I think there's there's so much that shifts. So, um, you know, speaking of that, because you are someone that I do uh, learn prompting and stuff from. What's that process like for you? So you've got 
there's a process to understand all the things. And then there's like the process of application, you know, and some of that might be just borrowing from people and learning and testing things. But like, how do you kind of tweak, dabble, edit, modify, think through prompt creation? Because I think the other interesting spaces, and I'm speaking at it from a K-12 education spaces, we still have a lot of people that are just learning how to like write prompts, like into chat GPT for the sake of just getting text responses back. Mm -hmm. And people are now starting to realize, oh my gosh, this can create visuals, this can create diagrams, this can create video. And they know, but now they're kind of eager to learn more. Uh, but again, they're like, I, I'm not an artist. I don't know what to put in here. I don't know what to say. What are, how do you go about that? You just have a thought in your head and you, you throw it in there and see what happens. Do you have like a process? I, I, I don't have a process. So maybe this is me selfishly trying to learn from you a little bit as well. Yeah, no, it's a, <laughs> inspiring. Well, it's kind of like it, it's evolved a lot because at first I had no idea how to, you know, write a prompt at all. So I would start, I started out with Lexica art because it had the largest library of stable diffusion images and you could just mm. take the prompt. You could get an example search by category or topic and then take the prompt. And I started out with just putting those prompts in and like running them on different generators to see what would happen and then um, modifying it for the things that I wanted to add. And I found certain things that I liked, uh, like cyberpunk and synthwave. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then you find little keywords and things like that. Now it's changing more. So it's not necessarily the tokens or keywords more where it's starting. I've, what I've been doing now more is dissecting what is it about that prompt that makes it, you know, makes that effect. And you can find it oftentimes in much simpler terms than all these complicated extra things you're putting in there. Um, so what I do now is kind of um, since I have an idea, like I know one of the things I'm kind of obsessed with, I'm still writing about this, is how using emojis. I figured out that emojis would generate images, you know, and how mm -hmm. does and um, it's something that I figured out like last January. And I kind of let it go after a while because I couldn't figure out how to predict what would happen. But now, right. thank goodness that ChatGPT is getting, you know, more and more advanced. It's explaining to me what the, how does the AI translate that? And what for each emoji, it break it down for me since I can, the multimodal stuff, I'd like to upload images into ChatGPT or any of the LLMs that accept it and ask it to explain to me why this, what, what, would, what would be a prompt that would recreate it or what is it about this picture? Like, explain to me all the details. What kind of art style movement is this? Um, what are the techniques? Um, what are the color transitions and just different types of the use of color and how that works? So I was able to, like, using that describe tool, I would use that mid journey. There's also another one called Clip Interrogator that is free online, Hugging Face. You don't have to have a mid journey account and you could just put a picture in there and it'll give you um, a stable diffusion prompt for it. And it's pretty accurate and it's pretty short. It seems like it's not going to work, but it does. So when you start kind of seeing, hmm, these words, me, this is going to cause this outcome and this is going to produce this result. Now, what if I add this and change this into that? I wonder if I could affect this. And how about if I want to try like cubism or I'll, you know, maybe if I add in pointillism or dot art or line art and different uses of color. And then I also test it out on different generators too to see because mid journey is not very helpful for understanding how other, you know, the majority of other um, tools are going to work. Yeah. So I, I always use other tools outside of mid journey because it helps you grow. It teaches you more then because mid journey, you just you really don't control that as much no. as you, you know, so it's going to give you that mid journey aesthetic. So I just kind of, I might sit there and a lot of times I'll find like, Hmm, you know, I wonder what this would look like. And let me try this. And I want to try yeah. this. Um, what is fauvism? And um, then I start checking out with, um, you know, LLMs. Can you explain what a fauvism is and what kind of <laughs> artists use that? And I don't like using artists names and, um, especially like or, or artists or directors or designers yeah. names because right. photographers, because it's just, you know, I got so much heat from it before and I thought, well, let me at least try to do it without. So when you do that, instead of just saying, you know, throwing in that artist name, it forces you to learn what makes that artist's work look like that. What are the right. techniques? 
what's the shutter style or whatever the camera angles that they're you know how to what kind of filters do they use and that if you I could say in the style of uh, Christopher Nolan but I also can say can you tell me write prompts that would produce something like Christopher Nolan and then get a list of those where it's just saying you know um, it's you know a noir style or whatever with you know the aggressive look or so, something dramatic and just learning how it's it's amazing because it's it's really word re- comprehension vocabulary and understanding yes. how that works and that's it because the LLMs understand it. Yeah. So it's kind of like a combination of art and then mechanics work you know sentence structure and mechanics and things like that that it's just that's what fascinates me how they all work together yeah it is and it's something it's something i've been grappling with in my own head especially when i think about education as we think about what does it mean as we we have language arts classes and we have social studies and we look at history and you know i think about i mean it's kind of connected to what you're sharing but i i I think of so much about the idea of like, hey, let's read a book and then let's write an essay at the end. Doesn't mean that that is good or bad or indifferent. Don't want to go down that rabbit trail. But like, how do we start to read the literature? How do we start to study architects of the history and past? How do we like the things that we've been teaching, looking at it through a new perspective and then not that we're doing it for the sake of AI, but if I can have a better understanding of the mindset and the thinking and the styles and the tones of, of people that have brought us to where we are today, that helps me think better. It helps me think through different perspectives and lenses. And then I also think about when, then I, when I do move into leveraging AI, which I think will just become just a natural part of existence for everybody at some point. It allows you to, to to have a better vocabulary and understanding. Like I, yeah. I've been joking with people, but not joking. Like I took high school photography and to date myself, that was back when we had manual cameras and I had to know <laughs> F-stops and aperture speeds and I had to understand light and I had to understand shadow. I had to understand all these things and I developed my film in the dark room and had to understand all that. And now as I'm getting into like the AI art and stuff, all those techniques that I was using with a manual camera are incredibly important now as I'm trying to, I know what I want in my head and yes. to, to try to capture that. So I find all that, you know, just, just so, so, so fascinating, um, you know, as you're sharing. Um, it, well, it gives you different ways to use the language too, because I'll say, what are other terms I can use for a sunset to represent yeah. the sky, the change, the mood, or, or the, the way the moonlight is shining. You know, it's just like you're, it's like a vocabulary bonanza of how yeah. to use that word to, you know, different ways you can say it and that it's going to be translated through that. And also just to kind of build that, that um, setting and make it into that particular mood or, you know, yeah, it, I think that that's true. You can use all of those terms and a lot of people who are frightened about, the AI taking their jobs and you know, things like that, like they, you can use it to, you can be even more productive than any, than I can, because I still don't know, like, oh, I didn't even think about that. Um, but you know how to use it. So whatever it is that you do, use it and try to, because it's just like everything else with the automated phones. Um, you know, I was a pharmacist before that was a thing when the people used to complain, I'm not going to that <laughs> pharmacy anymore because I'm not speaking to a computer when I call and I don't like it. And then eventually, well, you don't have a choice. That's what happens every, every place you go, drive throughs yeah. and things like that. Like it's here, it's coming, but you know, master it so that you can be, um, you know, light years ahead of everybody else. And then bring other people along with you because a lot of it, yeah, it's not that hard, but it's just being willing to um, open to learning it. Yep. Man, I could chat with you forever. And you know, I guess that's uh, maybe we'll actually go jump into spaces with you on Friday nights and continue to do that. So I want to be respectful of, of time for you because I know I could sit there and just keep peppering you with questions, but I do well, want to you. bring this to a close, even though it's been absolutely amazing. Um, and so part of the, the approach to the new season is I like to end with bringing this back kind of full circle to the, the human side of, of, of the guest. And you've already shared, gosh, so many incredible things already, but uh, one of the, I've got two, two things I'd like to end on and then we'll, we'll definitely make sure people know where to find you and you've got lots of spaces. So people know by now, you, all that stuff will be in the show notes. But my first question I have for you as we bring this to a close um, is what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? 
Um, I, I was thinking about that, and I'm not sure where I heard it, or I think I've heard it multiple times, but it's don't wait until you're ready to get mm-hmm. started. Just get started. Um, don't worry about failure. You're not going to, if you don't try, it doesn't matter about failure. You know, we're, it's just believe in yourself enough that you can do something. And if you fail, I mean, what's the worst that can happen? But go ahead and just get started. And because yep. it's, it's never a right time. And um, I learned like during the pandemic and I mean, I lost my father during that time too, like mm. over uh, the course of this time and, and other people too. Um, and it's like, you know, cause tomorrow isn't promised. So let's just go ahead and do it. Why wait? If you're sharing that then no maybe it's a movie. It doesn't matter what it is. Just, is there something that you want to share that might be um, of benefit or a cautionary tale to stay away. I don't think anyone's actually dove, done a rant yet. I'm not nudging you to do a rant. I'm just saying but everyone's been raving about something from, I think we've had the TV show, the bear to everything else in between. So um, <laughs> I'm curious, do you have a, a, a rant or rave that you just, think is so awesome in the moment uh or not so awesome for for, for, for the audience because i'm so behind on every show <laughs> i feel like i've missed out of like a few years worth of series and stuff that i was really into um I'm trying to think i don't know just yeah i don't know because well, how about we do well, this how about we rave your new youtube platform i'll rave for you oh. where you've got your space <laughs> you have content you, you're moving over there it's You've got your newsletter. We'll let people know where to follow here in just a second. But I think that change is 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 worth raving about because it's it's really exciting. And you're not just yeah. sharing tutorials. You're not just sharing pictures. But you've got your spaces and where there's conversations. There's so much more than than just hey here here's an image, uh, which is nothing wrong with that for the people that do that. But it's so much more. So I'll I'll rave for you, and maybe we'll close here, Heather, with <laughs> you know if people. Uh, want to learn more about you and they want to find your work that we've been talking about in all these spaces, you know, where, where, where are some of the best places to find you? Um, it's probably this, uh, my newsletter, Substack. I also um, have it on ConvertKit too, because ConvertKit's easier for downloads and, you know, to add um, more details in there. It's a little bit more yeah helpful than Substack is. So I, I've kind of like merged both, but I'm doing slightly different things on each one. I'm a little bit behind since I'm trying to get the YouTube going. I'm on TikTok too. That's a that's a heck of a process. And Instagram, mm-hmm. just trying to have a presence there. But um, YouTube is is a monster. Um, but I know that it is helpful, and we have a lot of tools now that we can use to help us, you know, put content on there. But it's um it's just a lot of work, video editing yeah. and um mm-hmm. those kind of things. Those are the skills that I had to ramp up on, and I'm working with my business partner, Thomas Haynes, is helping me with that tremendously. And it's hard to do when you have a job too, a full time <laughs> job. Like I wish I could get to the point where I could like walk away from the job, but I can't do that yet. So in the meantime, I just don't sleep much. Um, but yeah, so there on my newsletter, I still write um, on Medium occasionally. I need to start, you know, getting more of my articles over there. Um, but they're on X, of course. But um, in X is probably the most um, where people can learn the most about what I've been doing. Uh, I have a huge body of work on there and then the spaces, too. So um, between that and so, yeah, YouTube, I'm going to be um, putting more and more on there. Um, but yeah, that, and that's pretty much it. I guess that's yeah. enough probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got, you got a lot of spaces. And so we'll definitely get all that linked in the show notes for people to, to track you wherever they, they, they prefer. But yeah, I can't, um, appreciate you enough for taking time to gosh, chat with me today. And I would Thank recommend you. if people have nothing else, get on that newsletter and get on that YouTube channel and all the other spaces are great. But I think between Twitter or X, newsletter and youtube you'll finally find yourself subscribing to all the other platforms at some point in time too so heather this has been absolutely fantastic i'm so grateful for you to take time out of your busy schedule between work and children and and ai development to uh, have this conversation so truly honored and um i appreciate you sharing and and helping others in in their own journey of learning whether that's ai or just trying to learn how to process information like you shared so thank you yeah, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing for the, uh, the ed- in the education space for kids and K through 12 and all the listeners who are in that space. Thank you. You are appreciated. And I do appreciate you. And, um, you know, our 
we wouldn't be where we are right now without our teachers. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that. Hey, 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 Woke up at six o'clock in the morning, chilling with coffee mugs, me and coffee chugs, talking education all across the nation, pushing boundaries, thinking innovation. Hey, 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 chaos.